With the release of Oppenheimer, Christopher Nolan's most recent blockbuster, an essential piece of history has been rediscovered, a legacy that haunts us to this day. The reality is, is that we live in a world plagued by the idea of total annihilation, and Oppenheimer understood this. His ideas had grown greater than him. He had ruined the world, and he knew it. But who is he, truly? Let's take a look into the history of Oppenheimer. In the decades after the First World War, America was settling into a state of isolation, focusing on no involvement with foreign affairs. World War I, or the Great War as it was called back then, had taken a toll on the nation, both economically and in terms of human lives lost. As a result, there was a widespread desire among the American public to avoid getting involved in foreign conflicts and focus on domestic issues instead. This sentiment led to a growing inclination towards isolationism in the 1920s and 1930s. Even after the start of World War II, America chose to stay neutral in the fight between the Allies and Axis powers. That would all change in December of 1941, when Pearl Harbor, a naval base situated in Honolulu, Hawaii, was struck by the Japanese Navy. 20 American ships, 300 airplanes, and more than 2,000 people died in the attack. A then neutral America was horrified, prompting President Roosevelt to present his now famous date of infamy speech. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. With this, the US officially joined the war against the Axis powers. Now under the horrible threat of Nazi Germany, the fears of the public soon began to take shape. Nazi Germany's military prowess and territorial ambitions posed a direct threat to the US and its allies. And worse, the possibility of global annihilation came into view. Complete chaos. To understand how we got here, let's rewind. <laughs> It's December of 1938. Deep within the halls of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry in Berlin, German chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann embarked on a scientific journey. The research focused on unraveling the mysteries of atomic nuclei and the properties of nuclear elements. During their experiments, Hans and Strassmann bombarded a uranium sample with neutrons, expecting to observe the production of new radioactive isotopes. To their surprise, the uranium sample yielded barium, a lighter element, as one of the reaction products. Dumbfounded, Hahn and Strassmann repeated their experiments numerous times to ensure the accuracy of their findings. What was really going on? The uranium atom was in fact splitting into smaller fragments, which explained the appearance of lighter elements such as barium. This astonishing discovery challenged the prevailing scientific understanding of atomic structure, possibly even breaking the laws of physics. Let me explain. So, the law of conservation of mass states that in a chemical reaction, mass cannot be created nor destroyed. The amount of mass stays the same throughout in one way or another. However, it seemed almost as if the uranium had destroyed some of its mass to create lighter elements. The question hung in the air. Where did the rest of the uranium vanish? Seeking answers, Hahn reached out to Lee Meitner, a former colleague who had worked with Hahn at the Institute almost 30 years prior. Meitner, who had sought refuge in Sweden after fleeing Germany, received a letter from Hahn explaining the perplexing situation. To tackle this mystery, she enlisted the help of her nephew, Otto Robert Fersch, and the two got to work theorizing. The groundbreaking theory revolved around the concept of energy. Albert Einstein's special theory of relativity states that E is equal to mc squared. The equation revealed that energy and mass were two parts of the same whole. They were interchangeable. Thus, when uranium was bombarded with neutrons, it split into lighter elements, with the rest of the mass being accounted for as energy. In fact, an absolutely tremendous, terrifying amount of energy. They coined the term nuclear fission, 
for the phenomenon and published their findings in the February 11th, 1939 issue of Nature, creating arguably the most groundbreaking discovery of the 20th century. News of this discovery spreads fast, especially to Leo Szilard, a Hungarian physicist taking refuge in the US. He realized that one fission reaction of the heavy atom could result in detached neutrons, which could continue to set up more fission, creating a nuclear chain reaction. This would allow for vastly great amounts of energy. He teamed up with Enrico Fermi, an Italian physicist, and generated a concept for a nuclear reactor. And this meant something. If they could theoretically make a nuclear reactor from this discovery, what's not to say that they could make an atomic bomb? Or worse, that the Germans do. Szilard was terrified and knew something had to be done. He discussed his worries with the fellow physicist Eugene Wigner, and they both decided to contact a good old friend, Albert Einstein. On July 12, 1939, Szilard and Wigner drove to Long Island, where Einstein was staying and told him the news. Einstein in turn was aptly shocked by the possibility of world annihilation and gave them his word that he would give total support. They, with the help of a few others, got to work drafting a letter, warning the US of potential doom. It is conceivable that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may be constructed. A single bomb of this type, carried by boat and exploded in a port, might very well destroy the whole port together with some of the surrounding territory. Einstein gave the letter his approval, and they sent it off to FDR on August 2nd of the same year. Roosevelt would indeed take some action on the letter and would create the Advisory Committee on Uranium. They would investigate uranium and its properties, but the work that they did and the budget they had simply wasn't enough. It's now 1940. Germany was advancing fast, and scientists urged that they needed to organize and accelerate atomic research to create the bomb before the Germans. Forced by the very influential MOD report, a series of studies that affirmed that the bomb was indeed feasible to make. But Roosevelt was hesitant in approving such creation of a bomb until Pearl Harbor was attacked. Roosevelt would indeed give the scientists his thumbs up for them to start what would officially become the Manhattan Project. After the official launch of the project in 1942, it entered an intensive phase of research, development, and production. Various scientific teams were assembled at locations across the country, each with specific tasks. One of these teams, led by Enrico Fermi, conducted their research at Columbia University in New York. The primary objective of Fermi's team was to achieve a controlled and self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction, as Leo Szilard theorized a few years prior. To achieve this goal, Fermi and his team conducted groundbreaking work and built the world's first nuclear reactor, known as the Chicago Pile 1, or CP1 in a squash court under the stands of the University of Chicago's football stadium. Later, on December 2nd, 1942, CP1 achieved the first controlled self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction, and they had started the beginning of the end. Meanwhile, multiple facilities were built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and Hanford, Washington, for the production of uranium and plutonium. The main location, however, was in Los Alamos, New Mexico, where the creation of the bomb was dubbed Project Y. Here, J. Robert Oppenheimer was appointed as the lead scientist to orchestrate the creation and testing of the bomb. And the rest was history. This video was meant to be a predecessor to give some background information on Christopher Nolan's movie, just so you get a better understanding of what's really going on. This isn't my usual content, but if you really like this, then consider subscribing and letting me know in the comments. And I'll see you guys in the next cheat sheet.